Hi, right, hey, friends. Welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today I'm going to be talking about some of the stranger aspects of memory science in the ancient world. Thank you so much to John and Angela for this week's video suggestion. They're on Patreon. Uh, please consider checking out Patreon if you would like to also discuss uh, your thoughts with me or make suggestions, and also if you're interested in some of the other perks like Word of the Week or, or Book Review of the Week. So I want to start out with some Aristotle and give his thoughts on how memory even works. So he spends quite a bit of time arguing that memory is at least partially a physical or a bodily process, that it's not just something that's part of the soul or that's immaterial, right? So he gives a couple if you can call them proofs for this, I guess. He says that old people have terrible memories, basically, and if it was just a matter of the soul, then you would have the same memory the whole time. But clearly, as your body deteriorates, your mind deteriorates along with that. So there must be something physical going along here. So he describes it as wax, basically, uh, your brain or your memory as being wax. And he says that when you're young, your memory is very fluid, so you can't make a good impression on that wax. But then as you get older you can and it'll stick but then when you get even older it's sort of calcified it's gotten too hard and you can't make any new memories or use your memory very well so that is his description of how memory is related to the physical body and how it changes over time the next proof that he sort of gives of this is he says that when you're trying to remember something and you can't and you're just sort of stewing over it it affects your emotions and he also thinks that emotions are, are physical things that are part of your body and so if memory can cause emotions in you, then it must be physical, right? And I find his description of the not being able to remember really re relatable. And he also says that even after you've tried, you've given up trying to get that memory back, you still will be searching for it sort of subconsciously, I guess. And he says that people are particularly susceptible to this if they are melancholic, which is more or less depressed. And he says, uh, for these are especially affected by mental pictures, uh, which is sad, but probably very true. And finally, I just have to read you a quote from Aristotle because he says some crazy stuff here. He says, Dwarvish people and those who have large upper extremities have poorer memories than their opposites because they carry a great weight on their organ of perception and their impulses cannot from the first keep their direction but are scattered and do not easily travel in a straight course in their recollecting. So I guess he is imagining that the brain is actually in the, the chest area which was pretty common in ancient Greece and he's thinking that people who have larger heads kind of squash their brains and that impairs their memory somehow. I don't know what else to say about this, so I'm just gonna leave that there. So that's more or less how Aristotle thinks about how the memory works physically, but there was also a great interest in how to use that memory because writing materials are kind of expensive in the ancient world, and even if you can use them, uh, there are many instances or scenarios where you shouldn't be using them. Like if you're giving a political speech or a legal speech, you want to be able to just talk and not be have your head buried in your notes, right? So there was a great interest in learning how to remember things well, and the inventor of mnemonics or memory devices is credited as Simonides, about 550 years BC. That was the first human ever in the history of humans to use memory tricks to remember stuff. I'm sure not, but he gets the credit for it because he has a cool story and I guess he talked about it a lot. And the story goes that he had written this very long uh, elaborate poem about these twin gods named Castor and Pollux and he was at this dinner party uh, telling or reciting this poem to his patron who is Scopas. And Scopas was not impressed. He was refusing to pay him in full for this poem. He was trying to back out of his contract. And Cicero basically describes this to us. And Cicero obviously has a great interest in speech making. And he says, A little later, a message was brought to Simonides to go outside, as two young men were standing at the doorway who earnestly requested him to come out. Uh, so he arose from his seat and went out and could not see anybody. But in the interval of his absence, the roof of the hall where Scopas was giving the banquet fell in, crushing Scopas himself and his relations underneath the ruins and killing them. And when their friends wanted to bury them, but were altogether unable to know them apart as they had been completely crushed, the story goes that Simonides was enabled by his recollection of the place in which each of them had been reclining at table to identify them for a separate interment and that this circumstance suggested to him the discovery of the truth, that the best aid to clearness of memory consists in orderly arrangement. 
So that is an extremely gruesome story of all these bodies just totally squashed and then he's able to remember where each of them was sitting. I think the idea at the very beginning when it says two men were waiting at the door but then they disappear is that it was actually Castor and Pollux who were the gods in the poem and that they were actually very impressed with it so they wanted to warn him and get him out of the house. But anyway, yeah, very gruesome and apparently it led to the technique that we now often call the mind palace basically and we feature it in fiction like Sherlock Holmes, but for politicians like Cicero, it was actually an established te technique to use this. So you would picture like your villa or just a villa and you'd imagine, okay, I walk into my house and then on the right there's this painting of this thing and it will remind me of this. So it could get incredibly specific. Sometimes these details could get quite interesting. So I have heard, I do not know this, but I've heard that when you're trying to study or to work on something and you really need to focus that it can help a little bit if you play with your own balls a little bit. Uh, I guess it just gives your brain a little bit of oomph. Again, I don't know this, but that's what I thought of when I read this next passage. That's what first came to mind for me. Now, Cicero is not talking about that. <laughs> He's not talking about your own balls, but he does bring up ram's testicles. So let me read one more quote for you. If in order to facilitate our defense, we wish to remember this first point, we shall in our first background form an image of the whole matter. We shall picture the man in question as lying ill in bed, if we know his person. If we do not know him, we shall yet take up someone to be our invalid, but not a man of the lowest class, so that he may come to mind at once. <laughs> oh dear. And then we shall place the defendant at the bedside, holding in his right hand a cup, and in his left hand, tablets, and on the fourth finger, a ram's testicles. So there you have Cicero describing how to make this memory, all these things you have to remember to give this legal speech as vivid as possible. And he says, you know, if ram testicles is what's going to do it for you, use that. Thank you so much for checking out this video on the ancient science of memory. If you use any of these techniques, let me know, and I hope to see you again next week. Karate!